Hello, everyone. We welcome you today to Where Did My CPU Go? webinar. This webinar is presented to you by Encatech. We certainly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us um, for this webinar. Um, I'd like to also introduce our sponsor of uh, this event. Our sponsor is Redgate. Redgate is an organization out of the UK that Encatech has formed a partnership with. They develop um, a variety of tools that are very useful for DBAs and developers um, with over 600,000 users worldwide. I'd like to refer you over to their website. You can learn more about Redgate uh, by visiting the website that you see on this slide now. Um, they also manage a website by the name of allthingsoracle.com. This is a resource center for Oracle users. Um, so I certainly encourage you to visit that website. Um, some of you may be very familiar with it. That may have been how you heard about this uh, webinar. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenter today, uh, Carl Arau. He is a senior consultant here at Encatech, and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Damaris, for the introduction. And uh, for all the viewers, thank you for attending this webinar. So. Uh, let's start. Oh, before anything else, so why the title? Why, where did my CPU go? Uh, simply because for the past two or three years that I've been with Encatech, I've, I've been in, uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, server sizing and consolidations, and um, whenever we we get engaged by, by a customer, they would immediately ask us how many. How many, uh, let's say, X datas do we need to buy, or how many CPUs do we need to have for our environment, right? So for me to be able to tell them that, let's say, oh, you only need half rack, or you only need quarter rack, or let's say, 60 CPUs out of your workload. I mean, for me to be able to to, to tell them that, I need to know uh, the behavior of the CPU, how it works, right, and how to administer. It'll be coming from different hardware platforms, or let's say, uh, just uh, CPU speed differences, right? And for and by knowing all of that, then I'll be able to model their let's say end capacity or utilization moving forward. So uh, that's the driver of this uh, research. All right, um, a little bit of introduction. I'm Carl Arrow. And I'm a senior technical consultant at Encatech, and I'm a performance and capacity planning enthusiast. I have seven years plus DBA experience, so I'm getting older, so I just need to put plus on my years of experience. So I am uh, an Oracle Ace, OCP DBA, and I'm, R I'm an RGE, and I'm an Octable member. I do blog, and I have a wiki, and I do tweet as well. Uh, I'm, I work for Encatech, and we have a presence in uh, North America and EMEA. We, we have over 70 plus staff, and we mainly do uh, XData, uh, BI, Apex, and training. Um, uh, the books uh, at the bottom are, are some of the books that we've uh, written. And uh, this June 2 and 3, we'll be having this specialized conference just for XData and Big Data. Uh, it's called E4. So it's more like a, a hot sauce for for X data. So if you if you're more into uh, that uh, kind of uh, technology and and related technologies uh, about big data, then that's the um, a conference for you. So for our agenda, uh, the agenda would be uh, it's just four parts. So first, I'll establish. Uh, so there, there, so basically, there are two halves of this uh, presentation right here. So this is more of the hardware side. I'm giving you more of like a foundation on the hardware, si hardware side of things. Because if you're doing sizing, and let's say if you're pulling uh, uh, workload data from those servers, you need to know how those server behaves and how to compare speeds across those servers, right? And then after I've, I've given you the foundation on the hardware side of things, I'll be giving you uh, more of a deep dive on the database side of things, right? Uh, I'll be showing you how, how what's the, the different CPU events and how to 
uh, be able to have a consolidated view out of those databases that you're consolidating. All right. So let's start with this uh, database parameter called CPU count. So essentially, uh, the, the CPU count is the number of CPUs that your database is using. And that uh, actually boils down to the logical IOs, or log no, not logical IOs, but logical CPUs that you have on your database server. All right? And this is actually the parameter that you set when you do instance caging. So let's say if we set the CPU count to four, then that database or that instance will just make use of four CPUs out of that, let's say 16, right? So let's dive a little bit deeper on the uh, CPU architecture of uh, X data version two. So it's two sockets, eight cores, 16 threads. So two sockets meaning it has two physical sockets. So this is just one machine view of the Exadata version two. So two sockets, um, when it's, if it says eight cores, then each socket has uh, four cores, which totals to eight cores. And then for each core, you have a duplicate of that core. So if that duplicate is actually the hyper-threading technology. Um, and and for, for each socket, you got uh, eight threads or or logical CPUs, which totals to 16 threads, right? Uh, that's just a, a, a pretty picture view of that uh, uh, CPU. Uh, but uh, on the OS side, I've got this script called CPU topology. And when you run it, uh, it will show you this. Now, per row, it has a meaning. So the process source, that's essentially your logical CPUs. So let's say here, it's showing you 16 CPUs. The physical ID, the distinct numbers on your physical IDs, that will be your sockets. So you've got socket zero and then socket one. Um, for the siblings, you've got uh, the logical CPUs per socket. So for here, I've got socket zero and then it's got eight threads, socket one, and it's got eight threads to total to 16, right? And the core ID is just the core ID numbering across the course. And then the CPU course will be the the number of cores that you have per socket totals to eight cores. Now I've seen some in, I've been to some environments where where the, the number of this the siblings and the cores are the same. Now if you see that kind of uh, uh, number or let's say when you log into the server and, and you execute the script, if you see that those numbers are the same, then that means they they, they turned off the hyper threading. All right. On, on the later part of this presentation, I'll be showing you the performance effect of having that hyper-trading uh, feature turned off. All right. And then um, another thing that I want to show you is this tool by Intel. It's called the TurboStat. Um, so what does what, what this thing do is uh, it if you want to instrument uh, the 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 thread level of uh, performance and how it relates to the cores and the, and the package or the socket, then this tool is, is very good to have. And it also shows you in, uh, on, your, on, on, your, on your server or on your machine. So the Turbo Boost feature is another feature of the CPU where let's say it's more like uh, an automatic overclocking of that CPU. So uh, on the output of TurboStat, you've got this essential or critical columns where this TSC is actually the advertised uh, clock rate of that specific CPU. And this gigahertz right here is the Turbo Boost uh, clock rate of that CPU. So um, Turbo Boost is actually more, uh, is, is, is important or uh, is useful just for, let's say, uh, one or two single threaded process. And what, what happens is if you have just that running on your server, then the Turbo Boost will make that specific uh, thread or core, uh, it will increase that clock rate of that specific uh, thread or core, and it will 
it's it's pretty much like you're you're making the most out of the performance of that specific CPU, right? So it's automatic overclocking. So enough about the the CPU architecture. Now let's do compare CPU speeds. So there are different methods of comparing CPU speeds. All right. First is if you're going to do uh, publish benchmarks, and second is is actually running the benchmark on that specific server. For the published benchmarks, there are three uh, three benchmarks that I usually use, but uh, for for most of the uh, sizing, I use this spec in three two thousand six. But just for completeness, I'm going to be discussing this tree. All right. Uh, for the actual benchmark, there are two tools that's uh, available for you. Uh, the first is the CPU toolkit, which I wrote, and it can be uh, downloaded uh, on my blog. And if you go here, CPU toolkit, all right? And Slob, which is uh, created by Kevin Clausen. So Slob uh, has this uh, LIO harness where it just saturates uh, your CPU, and uh, that's essentially the actual benchmarking is. Uh, you, you, you saturate the, all of your CPUs and uh, uh, see how many logical IOs you can do per second, right, up to the max. So first is TPCC. So it's it's uh, made by uh, Transaction Pricing Performance Council. Uh, the measure of performance is by uh, throughput and price performance, right? So transactions per minute and uh, uh, dollar per transactions per minute. So when you go to the website, they've got these full disclosure reports, right? Um, and on those full disclosure reports, it's got these headers, but we're only after the CPU performance. So that's why we, we normalize the transactions per minute by core, right? And, and on the next few published benchmarks, you will see more and more of this, of normalization by core, because we're, we're after the performance of the core, right? Um, and, and then from here, uh, uh, the, the, F, the FDRs or full disclosure reports, they also have a page where it's all CSV files. So you can download that CSV file, um, put it in Excel or let's say massage it on a, let's say, uh, have this formula already when you massage the data. And, <clears throat> and then from there, you can easily grab that file. But, but for here, I'm just showing you how to do the, uh, the division of the TPMC by core, which is uh, the output of this is 100,000, which means um, the higher the number, the, the faster it is, all right? So the second is the spec rate 2006, which is by Standard Performance Evaluation Corporation. And spec rate measures the integer performance, which most of the software is actually is just making use of integer calculations, right? Or operations, and uh, the good thing about this spec int rate um, uh, benchmark is all of the CPUs are are being used because the previous versions of this spec int rate they're just benchmarking one CPU, which is then by by this processor advancements it's not any more relevant, right? So if you if you are saturating all of that CPUs. Uh, and then comparing to the other platform that's saturating all CPUs, then you, you can have that um, good comparison of performance, right? Uh, the spec and trade is used by OEM 12C Consolidation Planner. So Oracle uses this on their uh, uh, tool for consolidation, and it's being stored on the Sysman uh, EM spec rate live. So I'll, I'll just show you uh, a quick um, a view of this consolidation planner. So how does this uh, consolidation planner use the, the spec and trade? So let's say if I have two targets, right, and then that target will have an equivalent speed and this target will have an equivalent speed and both of those targets will have an equivalent utilization of that uh, of utilization. So uh, that's the speed and the utilization are being accounted so that let's say when you put it on a specific node that the, the, the end utilization will be something like this. All right. But the console what I don't like about consolidation planner is it's it just takes into account the host level utilization. Um, 
uh, so let's say for this guy right here, it's 69.8%, but it doesn't know how many databases are inside that specific box. So what we do when we do sizing, you break it down into, let's say, how many databases do you have and get that specific utilization just for that specific database so we can easily model it and play around with, uh, uh, with capacity planning. All right. So uh, in spec int rate, uh, the measure of performance is spec int rate per core. And on the website, they've got this uh, big HTML file, or they also have a downloadable CSV where you can massage the data, right? And uh, you just divide the, the peak by the number of cores that you have, which is this number. And the higher, it, the better. And so as I uh, said earlier, when you have it on a, let's say, a massage format, where I've already done the calculation, you can easily grab and compare one server to another, all right? So um, I'll, in a little bit, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the, the spec power. But uh, for, for this, I just want to uh, show you how, how you can apply this uh, on specific scenarios or comparison scenarios. So here I'm comparing two, two, 2007 uh, CPUs to 2012. Now, um, so I've got this TPCC and spec int rate, right? Um, and then these are the results of 2007. So for this, just focus your eyes on the first column, all right? So the first, co first column is the TPMC per core, and it's the result per core for the spec int rate. So I'm comparing um, uh, two platforms, the IBM and the Intel. Uh, platforms. Um, and, and back in 2007, the IBM is the fastest server uh, at that time. Um, and as you can see here, it, sh it shows that it's uh, 100,000 and the ProLiant ML370 34,000. Right? And, and if you look at the spec int rate, and if you look at the spec int rate, it shows you that it's 30 and then 18, all right? So the spec int rate reflects the performance gap on the T of the TPCC as well, all right? Now, let's move forward to uh, 2012. So that's the TPCC, and that's the spec int rate, let me hide this. Now, for the TPCC, you don't have you don't have any. Uh, let me just do this. For the TPCC, you don't have any uh, TPCC result for the power uh, servers, but then you have the results of of everything on the spec int rate. So for the power server, it's rated at 45, and then the the Intel boxes are rated at about 43. Now, you would notice that this tree right here, the IBM of uh, this Intel box, this Intel box right here, they are pretty much on the range of 45 to 43, right? So what does that mean? Um, then I can, I can pretty much uh, say that uh, in 2012, these platforms are pretty much um, closing in on, with, the, with the IBM uh, platform in terms of CPU performance, right? And given that the spec int rate numbers reflects the TPCC result, then I can assume that this guy right here, the result will be probably around 100,000 as well, right? Or 100,000 plus, because this is higher than these two right here. All right, so I mean, that's how you, how you uh, make use of those numbers. Right? And it's pretty handy. So also you would notice that uh, I've got this right here, uh, a, a Spark machine, right? Just to show it to you for completeness that, let, let's say, so for the Spark, they've got uh, slow CPUs, but they've got a lot of CPUs. See that, 128 compared to 16, right, on the Intel? So for this platform right here, so if you have, let's say, a specific need for, let's say, a highly threaded, let's say, workload, 
and uh, you want a lot of uh, logical I.O. capacity and, you, and the application is very sensitive with, with let's say the clustering, it doesn't want to be on a clustered node, right? Then this kind of server is right for you, right? Now, um, let me show you really quick, uh, let, me, let me go back, let me go back to this slide and I will show you really quick uh, the, the data set that I have for the spec and trait. So I've downloaded this file and I've put it on Tableau. So this is the result of spec and trait. And then I'll, I just want to show you this, this, the CPU speed through, through the years. All right, so this 2006 up to 2013. And these are different hardware platforms, right? So you can hack this data. So now what I'm gonna do is I will color them by processor group. So you've got AMD, IBM, Intel, and Spark, right? So earlier on the, on the slide deck, we were actually looking at the 2007 and 2012, right? So 2007, this green right here, is your IBM, which is the faster server around that time, right? And through the years, as you can see uh, from the previous slide deck, it, I, I told you that Intel is catching up in terms of CPU speed. So from the graph, it's really evident, right? So if I just split this into, let's say, processor groups and, and, by, and by year, so processor groups and by year at the bottom, so you can see here, that the, the IBM and the, the Intel, uh, let's say uh, 2013, 2014, right? They're they're pretty much, I mean, I mean, on, I mean, on the same on the same top in terms of speed, right? And then another interesting thing is this Spark platform when when they when they recently launched this T5 servers, um, so. Previously, I was showing you this slow CPUs, right? When they launched that new new platform, it, it's just a very uh, big speed uh, jump for that platform. So they, they came all the way from 18 uh, to about uh, 30, all right? So it's pretty much doubled performance, right? Um, what else? Oh, let me sh let me show you really quick this uh, spec power that I have. So spec power, um, on the on the end of this presentation, I sh I'm, I'm, I've I've highlighted some books, and one of the books actually uh, tells you how to make use of spec power uh, just for uh, I mean energy efficiency efficiency comparison. But I don't really use this for sizing. I still make use of spec and trait for sizing because it's just CPU centric, right? It's just raw CPU uh, performance, right? And uh, when we, when we, I mean, when we slice for database servers, we're really after performance, right? But but uh, this benchmark right here, it's it's just showing you, they only have AMD and Intel available on their data set, and spec and create, they have the four processor groups available for for that specific data set, which is pretty good. In TPCC, you've got lesser data set because it's not just about CPU; it's 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 a whole stack. You've got the storage and all of that, right? So for CPU-centric, I would still use uh, the spec and trait. So for here, for the spec power, um, so, so the measure here is server-side Java operations, SSJ, per watt. So you're measuring the energy efficiency of that specific CPU. So still, uh, from, from, from this graph, Intel is still the winner, right? And, and if you, if you uh, normalize normalize it by core. So let's, so let's say this is a four four core, eight core, right? And then it's divided into AMD and Intel, right? So uh, as you can see here, Intel is still is still the the, the best in terms of energy uh, efficiency. But then you've got this AMD where it, it has a lot of cores, and and then uh, for me, for, for let's say database. I would still go with this, which is high uh, performance and, and, and low power than, uh, than these guys right here, right? So it's, it's just uh, another data to look at when you're, when you're doing server comparisons, all right? So for the, um, 
actual benchmarking. So the actual benchmarking is actually running a specific code on your specific server or on that specific server that you, you're, you're looking at on migrating to or let's say migrating uh, from, right? So for the, for the benchmark, you've got the CPU toolkit and slog. Um, so for this example right here, um, it's both of them are are, are this, this this are the same box, right? So the difference with these two two uh, benchmarks is the way it, it behaves in terms of workload. So for the CPU toolkit, it tends to saturate one uh, thread at a time. So let's say if I run let's say start CPU of one and end CPU of let's say eight, it will saturate one on the first cycle and it will saturate two on the, on the second cycle and then three on the third cycle and, and, and it will go on into the, until it saturates everything, right? For the slub, so let's say if it's, let's say run in it, uh, let's say eight, so let's say if two, four, eight, then what it will do is it will saturate it uh, across the CPUs as you uh, give more uh, drivers to that specific, uh, let's say, driver script, right? So having this, um, let's say, difference in workload is still uh, very beneficial. Uh, let's say if you are uh, benchmarking or analyzing a specific, let's say, scenario where, let's say, for me, I want to analyze what's the difference of if I turn off the hyper trading or if I turn off the turbo boost, right? So it's still best to have different views and a consistent, let's say, test case when you do your changes, right? Now, uh, for here, I want to apply the uh, specific uh, benchmark result, right, running actually on the server uh, by, uh, so this is the, by, by, by running the actual benchmark on the server and making use of that for uh, server migration, right? So let's say here, I'm just comparing the V2 and X2. Uh, the V2 is this, which means the 2.1 million, so it's saturated all of the, the, the 16 CPUs of that server right here. And then for the, for the X2, it's saturated all of that C, uh, uh, CPU of, the, of that specific uh, server, 24 CPUs. Now, this right here will, will be your, uh, let's say, uh, speed. So 2.1 and 3.6, right? That's your performance comparison between those two platforms, right? Because it 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 uh, was only able to attain, let's say, 3.6 million logical IOs per second and 2.1 million logical IOs per second. Now, making use of that number for, let's say, a migration scenario, is uh, uh, let's say very uh, beneficial. Because let's say if you have this, let's say transactions per second and the utilization of your host uh, source machine, you can, so with, with the numbers that you have for the speed comparison and this utilization numbers, you can estimate what will be the end utilization on your target machine without even doing the migration itself, right? Uh, you, you just need a few basic simple math and you'll be able to arrive pretty much, uh, I mean, at the same utilization as you would do the actual migration. So let's, let's move on to that. So first, what you would do is you have to get the, uh, what I call the cheap efficiency factor, which is more like the CPU speed, all right? Um, and, and the source logical IOs per second would be the, the V2, which it only attained 2.1 million and the destination will be 3.6, right? And then dividing that will be 0.58, 0.58. What's, what's the meaning of that? It means that the one CPU of the version two is equivalent to 0.5058 of the, of the X2, all right? Because X2 is a much faster CPU, that's why you only be needing this much CPU. Now, the next thing to do is uh, apply that speed factor and multiply that to the, to the number of CPUs that you're using 
on your on your source box. So here I've got the point point fifty eight, and I'm multiplying it to the source host you, you, source source host CPU multiplied by the utilization, which makes it uh, seven point thirty six, which means I'm just using seven CPUs out of the 16 CPUs. Now, if I multiply that with the speed factor, then I'm only getting 4.29 CPUs. All right, and, and uh, after that, uh, I will multiply that 4.29 to the uh, capacity of the X2, which is 24 CPUs. And then once I've, I've, I've I divide this, I'll get this 17.8%. So if I do the actual migration, all right, you see the, the, the utilization, it's pretty much close to the 17.8, right? So why? Because you're, you're essentially migrating from slower CPUs to faster CPUs. As you can see from the, from the SQL drivers, so the response time is 0 0.006, when you migrated to the faster CPU, uh, the, the response time, it went to 0 0.003, all right? Essentially what happened here is, let's say you've got this, you've got this workload on the V2. Now, when you migrated to the X2, it, it got cut, 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 halved in, in, into, into half. So you've got this X2 right here, right? So you're, you're now making use of, uh, uh, or you're making use of less CPUs because you're moving to faster CPUs. Now, uh, this headroom that you gained by migrating from V2 to X2, so here you're doing 1,200, right? So you have more headroom for more transactions per second, right? So you can double your, let's say, uh, transactions per second because you essentially uh, gain that headroom by uh, migrating to faster CPUs. So let's say this can be uh, about 2,000 range, right? And then still uh, get that specific or the same amount of utilization that you had from your previous server, right? But then you're making more transactions per second. That's the beauty of the capacity planning math behind this and uh, being able to forecast it without even doing the migration, right? Um, let me, uh, oh, let me show you something. Now, what we, what we do is, uh, I'll show you this tool. So we have this tool that we use because you, you already have the capacity planning formula, right? Now we want to, we, we, we have this, uh, I mean, sizing, we have this tool where we have the sizing, we have this tool where we, we, we have the, our sizing process uh, built in on this tool, uh, where let's say if we'll be migrating from a if, let's say if we'll be migrating a bunch of databases, um, we want to to be able to account for their speed differences, right? So normally uh, we we send them s extract scripts, and the extract scripts will give us the workload of those databases, and then from here. Uh, the, the customer will already have, let's say, they're already seeing on or they're, they're already uh, looking into uh, uh, purchasing a specific configuration. So we would put that here. Uh, let's say it's a quarter rack, right? And then from there, we would lay out, let's say, how many databases they're expecting to migrate across that quarter rack. And then um, after that, we will be able to see that visually the overall utilization and the recommended hardware for that workload across CPU mem across the CPU memory and storage size, right? And then from there we will be, uh, let's say, uh, we will be able to tell moving forward how many months will it take them to reach the 75% utilization of their specific cluster. So I showed you uh, a simple scenario where we are migrating from V2 to X2. Now. Uh, but here we are using the, the uh, actual workload numbers, right? So what if we uh, make use of that, right? So let's say uh, I have a, so because this is a, 
uh, an X2 an X2 environment, so it's two and a quarter rack, so it's two nodes. The 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 speed is uh, so let's substitute this first with this real actual values. So the X data speed of this would be 3.6, right? And then the number of CPUs for that specific configuration is 24. All right, and then uh, my my source machine it will have 16 CPUs, and I don't know it will have 16 CPUs, but the speed of that specific machine is 2.1. So let's say let's put let's put it here 2.1, and then uh, the the CPU utilization or the number of CPUs that this server is using is 46 percent. So I would put 46 percent right here. And you see the result, it's 18%, which is pretty much just the rounded off value of this, right? Now, if I don't have this, this uh, actual benchmark numbers, then I can, I can uh, go to spec int rate and get the, I can go to the spec int rate and get the specific speed of that specific server, right? So let's say here, I've got an X2 quarter rack, so uh, my, my speed would be uh, 26, right? And then on the V2, my speed would be uh, 16. Now, if I make use of spec in trade, I'm still pretty close to the, to the uh, utilization of uh, what uh, utilization of uh, how it is if I, if I make use of the actual benchmark numbers, which is pretty cool, right? And, and I can also make use of this to, to do um, high-level uh, estimations. So let's say, uh, let's say you have an M9000 box, right? So let's say you have an M9000 box. It's one big, giant box. And then let's say on one good day, you, you, you just decided to, hey, I want to migrate to uh, X, X4, uh, let's say, uh, dash 8 full rack. How much would it take or how many, uh, or let's say how many nodes or how many, how would it look like if I migrate this whole thing to this X4-8 X4 full rack? So from a high level point of view, um, because this guy right here will, will have a bunch of databases running on it, right? And then it will make use of specific uh, workload, right? So but for high level, I would just assume this to be using the 100%. And then how would that 100% look like on this target environment? So I can easily do that with this capacity planning uh, math that I showed you. Um, so here, so let's say this, and I'm, I'll be using spec and trade, for example, for this example. So the spec and trade of M9000 is uh, 14, and it's got 256 CPUs. So let's say I'm laying it out on, let's say, uh, a full rack. Of, uh, of an X4, right? Eight, eight nodes, uh, 39 speed, and 48 CPUs. Now, from the graph, uh, it shows me that uh, if, I, if I migrate one M9000 box to an X4, then it will be about 23% or 24% CPU utilization. And with that, uh, I'll have about 61 months to be able to reach 75 of percent utilization, which is about uh, five years, right? So, but but here I still have about I still have a lot of headroom. I still have a lot of free. So with this, I can just let's say, oh, I, uh, I may be able to migrate my other M9000 box to this uh, configuration. So uh, I mean, with that capacity planning format I showed you, you can easily uh, model uh, how how it would look like without even doing the migration, right? So I can, let's say, oh, I, I'll still be able to fit another one from this configuration. And then, and then see that, uh, let's say, new, new machine on, on, a, on a high level or cluster-wide perspective. And you can play around with, with this. And let's say if I fail two nodes, what would happen to the rest of the nodes, let's say, right? So here, when I failed the two nodes, all of the other servers went to 96%, right? And, and, and uh, 
but but the high level utilization did not change, right? It's it's because all of that resources went to the other remaining nodes, right? So that's the beauty of 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 this uh, plastic planner formula. Now uh, this is just the v2 and x3 uh, uh, x2. This should be x2 and x3 comparison, all right? And let's move ahead with this uh, cores versus threads. Now this is a pretty complicated graph, but but then this is very useful for explaining the CPU behavior of uh, the, uh, when 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 it gets to a point where it's very 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 saturated. So I'll discuss three points uh, uh, on on this uh, uh, graph. First is the default. Right, uh, and what if I turn off the turbo boost? And what if I turn off the hyper threading? Right, so the default behavior where everything is turned on, right? How it works is, uh, let's say this is a uh, one socket, four cores, and eight threads. Uh, let's say I have here uh, eight threads, and I've got four cores in it. Right, uh, the default behavior is uh, what usually happens is, let's say. If if you saturate the whole box, once you get past the cores that you have on your server up to the max number of threads that you have right here, you're only getting about 20%, 20 to 30 percent of uh, speed increase up to the max number of uh, threads, right? And that also varies, depends on the uh, uh, on the workload. But but then you're not getting linear performance, you're not getting linear performance out of this uh, hyper-threaded CPU use, all right? That's the default behavior. And later I'll show you something about uh, the instance caging where, where uh, you, normally you would set it at the 75% area of this total CPU use that I have. So uh, for, for the, for, well, so what happens to the sessions when it, when it goes to this specific area of performance. So as you saturate more and more CPUs, when you reach the maximum number of threads that you have, you you, experience, you started to experience CPU weight, meaning you're already running on run queue, right? So for this driver, uh, the driver SQL that I have here, it's one second per execution, where if, if I, let's say, saturate it up to the max number of CPUs that I have, and at this point, uh, I have more and more sessions uh, sharing this uh, nonlinear uh, CPU capacity right here, right? So um, at this point, right, my one second elapsed time is already uh, 1.2, which is the point 0.2 is waiting on CPU weight, right? That's what's what happens uh, when uh, on the session uh, level numbers, and as I and as I saturate more and more CPUs, the more I will be waiting on CPU weight, or the more of of the CPU weight will be the component of my response time, right? But what if I let's say turn off the turbo boost? So if I turn off the turbo boost, then uh, as as I, as I said earlier, it's just uh, it just matters for one or two single threaded processes, right? So that's just what it is. But when you start to, let's say, um, saturate m more and more CPUs or all of it, then it doesn't really matter anymore. Right? It's just pretty much the same. Even though the turbo stat will show you that it's still doing the, the, the clock rate increase, it's not really giving you anything. So for the hyper threading, for the hyper threading, so if I turn off the hyper trading, so this is hyper trading turned on, and this is hyper trading turned off. So if I turned off the hyper trading, what happens is I lose all of my threads, right? And then, and then at that point, as I saturate, let's say more and more CPUs, then after the course, because I don't have any more threads, right? So after that, I will start to experience CPU weight right away. So with with the hyper trading turned on, so here. With the hyper trending turned off, you experience the, the the queuing effect earlier, right? And it's bad for your response time. But for this, with hyper trending turned off, you're you're experiencing it on a later stage, 
right? Even though you're not getting any linear performance out of this, uh, avoiding, completely avoiding the CPU weight still helps uh, on, on at the standpoint of performance, right? So that's uh, how uh, you explain the CPU behavior. So that 30% depends, really depends on the workload, right? Uh, so we got the CPU toolkit and the slob, and it shows you uh, the difference on behavior of, of these two, uh, which is here, I've, I've, it's pretty much conservative that I've only got 17% uh, performance out of this workload, and here it's 21%. There's an Intel white paper that actually uh, specifically tells you that you're only getting 30%, but then it's variable depending on, well, it shows you on my test case, right? So read on this, you'll, you'll, it's pretty good stuff. Oh, and by the way, um, if I, so as I'm, so what I was saying earlier is when I do instance caging, I would, I would, I would just set it to this 75% area where uh, everything is pretty much still predictable, right? Because here, as I'm doing more and more work, I'm sharing more of that CPU cycles with other sessions, and I'm not getting any more faster, right? I'm just saturating the box. So normally, I would just set it at the 75% at the area. So what, I, what do I mean by 75% area? area? So let's say if you have 48 CPUs on the, on the box, then 75% of that is 36. If you have three databases on that uh, box, then set, oh, uh, set each of them to, uh, to 12 CPUs, 0.75, right? 36 divided by three. So set each of them to 12 CPUs. But then there's a MOS node that actually tells you, uh, let me do this, I have a tool for that, CMOS. All right, and there's actually uh, a MOS node here, this doc ID that actually tells you that uh, uh, you must set it to just about 75%, right? And this guy right here, this note right here, doesn't really explain uh, really well why you have to set it at 75%. So my test case right here that I've shown you, I've just, I've just quantified that uh, MOS note that uh, you, know, you have to set it at 75, or you can actually, uh, uh, what they call that, over allocate, right? Meaning you can have, uh, let's say, one database that's having these 12 CPUs and then the other one has 20, right? Given that you know the workload of that specific database that it can go uh, as high as 20 and not, let's say, the other two databases that you have that's set to 12, not, uh, let's say, content with that 100, with that 20 uh, CPU count that you have on that database. Because if all of that becomes active, then you have more than, you're asking more than what you have on your capacity, right, which is 48. So yeah, so let's move ahead with this different CPU events. So we're already done with the hardware side of things, and I've already given you in, uh, that, that hardware foundation. Now we're moving on with the different CPU events. So there are three different CPU events. It's called the CPU, CPU weight, and uh, CPU scheduler. So the CPU is more of like the CPU is, is, is the real CPU cycles. CPU weight is the time spent on one cube. CPU scheduler is the time spent above your CPU count. So let's say if you set your CPU count to four and you're asking for six, right? So that uh, difference of six to four, you'll have two, let's say AAS on CPU scheduler, which I will show you to you uh, in a little bit. So here, um, it, this is AES CPU, and and uh, uh, just always remember that uh, one AES CPU is equivalent to one thread that's 100% utilized. So for here, I've got eight CPUs on my box, and I'm using two uh, AES CPU, and this means I'm on my OS side, this will be 25% utilization when I execute, let's say, top or VM stat, right? Now, uh, on the session level, uh, you, will, you, will, 
on the session level or top activity page, you will see this uh, to AES CPU as well, right? But then, as you can see from the bottom, you've got four sessions, right? So, um, so how does that work? Um, well, two AES CPU or two average active sessions doesn't always mean that you have two highly active sessions. It can be, let's say, four uh, sessions contributing to this uh, two AES CPU. So from here, I've got about this, one, two, three, and four, comp contributing to this two AES CPU. Now, the CPU weight. Uh, the CPU weight means uh, it's, it's the time spent on run queue. So from here, I increase the load to 10, right, to the 10 area. Now, I got this load average right here, and there's a difference of, let's say, the, the instance foreground CPU with this load average. That difference is actually this. That's your CPU weight right here. So all of this CPU... CPU cycles are being spent on one queue. Now, on, on Ash, or on the top activity page, because the top activity page, activity page pulls from Ash data, uh, it doesn't show you that specific light green uh, graph, simply because Ash, uh, let's say, even though you're out of CPU, it's still uh, accounted as on CPU, right? Uh, but, but uh, I would still go to the performance page just to validate this, but this uh, this workload right here. But pretty much, if you know that you have eight CPUs on your server and you're making use more of that, then this is already running on run queue. So from here, the sessions right here, this section is mostly running on run queue, and this section right here are the only ones that are getting served by the actual CPU. So the CPU scheduler. Uh, the CPU scheduler is more of like uh, the instance caging. So, uh, so if you implement instance caging, oh wait. So if you implement instance caging, so let's say here I, I've set the instance caging to CPU count of four, then uh, this drops to to. So what does this mean? Is I I box the the Oracle kernel. Uh, uh, the, the, the CPUs that, or, that the Oracle kernel can only use to, to about four CPUs, right? From, from a high level uh, point of view, you're still asking for 10 CPUs, right? But only four is being served on the real CPUs. So this other uh, area right here, they're just waiting uh, and being capped by the resource manager, right? And you, you will also see that from the top, top activity page that, let's say, this is just the, the, the area where all of those sessions are being served, and the area right here are being uh, uh, preempted by the resource manager. So the wake event will be resource manager CPU quantum. So putting this all together, the CPU, the, the different CPU uh, events, uh, so let's say if you have a sudden plan change, and then that plan change uh, contributed to, let's say, a high load average, or let's say this server of yours being 100% CPU utilized, and you don't have any instance caging turned on, then immediately you would say, you would see the CPU wait, all right? And then once, you, once you've already logged on on the server, then you can implement the instance caging, cap it to CPU count of 12. And then at this time period, you can do your troubleshooting because everything is already under control, right, in terms of the Oracle and, and on the OS side, because the load average just went down. And then from here, you implement the fix, and then you just, uh, and it, it goes back to the normal workload, right? Now, uh, uh, just remember that whenever you do uh, instance caging, set it up to the point where it's just above the, the CPU uh, workload that you have, or do characterize it, characterization of your workload, and set it to uh, a point where you still have a headroom for spikes, right? So the last part is the CPU monitoring and capacity planning. Now um, I've got this. Uh, so the, so we'll talk about the tools to monitor the CPU. 
and we will talk about uh, tools to be able to get a, a holistic view of that uh, or consolidated CPU view of uh, a bunch of databases. But we will start with the OS side. So the, for, for the OS tools, there are different OS tools, VMstat, Top, MPStat, right? There, there are also cool tools. Let's say it's CollectL. CollectL outputs uh, performance data in on just one row. Let's say CPU, memory, disk, uh, I.O. Uh, oh yeah, disk. And then there's this um, TurboStat dash that, that C where it, I've shown it to you earlier where it instruments the per thread uh, performance and the TurboStat, TurboBoost uh, uh, feature. Now, uh, there's also this DCLI in XData where you can easily tell uh, which nodes are um, uh, saturating the, the box or, or, or the, the whole database, right? But in Oracle, there's this Oracle load map. The Oracle load map uh, is like an enterprise-wide view of your load, right? And when you click on this, it, you will be, uh, take, it will go directly to the performance page of that specific database. But I will show you in the, in the next few slides that there's a value of having more dimensions out of this specific data set, right? with the AWR analytics. So when you click on any of those box, you will be taken to this performance page. So I was uh, telling you earlier that uh, uh, when you set the CPU count parameter, just go above that green line, right? So you have to do your workload analysis and uh, take into account that specific CPU spikes, right? So that's the performance page and it gives you uh, real-time and uh, historical view. But uh, what did it, it, so I've got this AWR toolkit which pulls AWR information across databases and consolidate them in one uh, CSV or one big table. So what I usually do is, let's say on the customer side, I would run this extract scripts and then load it on my uh, data warehouse on my laptop. Uh, so let's say each client will have their own dimension tables, and then and from there I can analyze it with Tableau uh, Analytics. Uh, there's another version of that script where you can download it from here, right? And it gives you the holistic uh, view of uh, your your database. It captures top events, stat, I/O, CPU, storage, services, top SQL, more of like characteriz characterization of that specific database, right? Um, you can download it from here. You don't have to create that warehouse anymore. It just outputs it in CSV files. You just have to aggregate that CSV file. Now, how do you make use of that CSV file here? So the CSV file is just really a CSV file. But uh, Tableau makes sense of this uh, uh, dimension uh, columns where you have this distinct number of values right here and you can only just uh, drag and drop it on, let's say, whatever measures you have. So let's say here, this is my, the total number of CPU seconds that I have for that specific server, right? So I can have a dimension of that by instance or by host name, right? I'll show it to you in a little bit. Another thing that's really cool about AWR analytics is this time dimension. So the time dimension uh, with this uh, the ability to easily drag and drop and do data exploration, the time dimension takes care of uh, sn snap differences across databases. So let's say if you have 15 minutes or 10 minutes or one hour snapshots, and if you let's say combine them in one CSV file, wh whatever uh, let's say measure falls on that specific time dimension, that will be accounted and all of that will be aggregated in one pretty brand. Uh, and another beauty of this is you can always right click and view data, and then from the view data, you can drill down on that specific data set. And then from that data set, you can say, oh, this is not really ag aggregating it correctly, so I may have to do some kind of aggregation or let's say um, do max instead of average, right? So it's pretty cool for data exploratory uh, purposes. So uh, the, the visualizations that you can do here is something like this. So let's say this is a, a consolidated CPU view of a half-crack exadata, right? So 
let's say if it's got dimensions, right? So you can really just drag and drop things. So I will, I will show you a really quick example. And then we will be wrapping up in, uh, in a little bit. <clears throat> so, um, so remember, we've got this tree map view. It, oh, sorry. We've got this tree map view um, where, so this is like the performance page, right? So what if you can actually drag and drop things where you can show, let's say, oh, I want to see a, a monthly view of that tree map view, right? This is cool right here. So what if I want to drill down of that tree map view per host name, right? But, but for capacity planning purposes, uh, I, I mean, you'll just after this consolidated view of this specific resource, right? So this is the this is the weight class um, of of this bunch of databases. Because if I let's say just drag it on the core, then it will show me the the instance names who are the resource huggers of those specific weight class, right? But just for the purposes of let's say CPU capacity planning. I would just filter the CPU, CPU weight, and then CPU scheduler. So I would filter all of those three CPU events, all right? And then from here, I already have my consolidated peak workload, right? So from here, I, I have this 70 CPUs. I'm asking the 70 CPUs at this particular workload period, right? So this works really well for a bunch of databases. So let's say here, uh, I've got this another example where I have 120 or 100 something databases across, let's say, uh, 39 host names, right? So if I consolidate, so they're essentially downsizing and they want to determine how many exadatas or nodes do they want to, uh, will, will to, uh, are required to have, right? So when you, whenever you're doing sizing, you are always, you always need to get the consolidated peak of those databases that you're sizing. So from here, I'm just asking for 120 CPUs, right? And then from here, I can just uh, get the data out of this and put that on our, on our tool and, and put it right over here. And then from there, it will model, we can pretty much easily model the capacity of, that, of those specific number of databases, right? Now let's go back to this uh, half rack view. So from this half rack view, you can you can drill it down by server, right? So here you have a half rack view of CPU load, right? And then you can see here that you have this number four node. It's so this is one quarter. So you have this quarterly process that's uh, overutilizing this fourth node. So for, from the point of view of load distribution, this view is very very useful because let's say you can you can uh, do what you can do is for every quarter I can distribute these specific instances on nodes three and two, right? So I can uh, I'll be able to handle that specific workload spike, right? And then what you can also do is uh, a lot of what if scenarios. So let's say if we want to consolidate this database in this database right here, um, it will just automatically sum up that specific uh, uh, instances. So if I have two nodes and two nodes racked, what will be the uh, requirement of that? Uh, and then in terms of CPU, so let's say if, if this is 48, all right, and then if I have uh, X2-2 uh, boxes, then I can just uh, always divide it by the number of CPUs or capacity that I have uh, so it means this workload right here needs two, two servers, right? Which is, that's what you can do with AWR analytics. So I've already, I've already shown you the CPU usage per host, all right? And then I've already shown you the CPU redistribution across nodes. So uh, I'd like to uh, wrap this up uh, really quick. So what I've shown you is, uh, I've, I've shown you I've shown you the, the CPU foundation. So how do you compare uh, CPU speeds, right? And then uh, I've shown you the different CPU events. And then how do, you, how do you scale it? How do you scale the monitoring across multiple databases, right? By, by doing analytics, all right? 
so uh, uh, and, and just to repeat that, I've shown you how to compare CPU speeds and showed you the coarse versus threads behavior, the different CPU events, and the uh, um, AWR analytics. And I've got this uh, a bunch of resources and go through all of them. I have a white paper. It's a more detailed uh, white paper. And then these are the books that uh, I'm recommending for you to read if you're more interested on the, the capacity planning. And uh, yeah, that ends my presentation. So if you, got, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to, to email me on this uh, email address. Thank you, guys.